Hey, Megan, welcome back to the Keto Camp Podcast. Hey, Ben, thanks for having me on. This is your fourth time uh, on the show. Uh, can you believe it's been four times? That's wild. I don't always love chatting with you. Um, four, four is a, a lucky number for me. So oh. uh, hopefully, you know, people get a lot of good information then from this Yeah, episode. well, perfect. We'll make it our best conversation yet. <laughs> raising the bar. So we were just chatting offline because um, you're pregnant. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I should ask you, that's, is that public news? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can remove it if it's not. It is, uh, it is very public okay. news. I shared a lot of my journey to get here. Yeah. Um, so we, we didn't feel so, you know, nice keeping it to ourselves. And also people were asking me nonstop. So we just kind of ripped off the Band-Aid and let everyone know. So we could talk about it. So share that journey. I know that it's been so quite a quite a journey for you and your husband. So share that journey, what it, what it was like and some of the things you did, because I know there's a lot of people who are watching and listening who might have had a similar journey or they may be on that journey that you were on. Yeah, it was really wild. You know, I met my husband at 30. We got married at 31. I wanted to live with him for a bit and have some cool adventures and thought, OK, you know, 35, 36, we'd settle down and have kids. And then I kind of got um, hit with some environmental toxin issues that I wasn't expecting. We had moved into this house. We love this house. It had passed all of the traditional home inspections as mold free and, you know, just a healthy place to live and to bring a family into the world. We got super excited. And within several months of moving into that house, I was bedridden. I couldn't even stand up to pour a glass of water or even make a cup of tea. Um, my blood pressure was like on a good day, like 74 over like 40. It was Gosh. really awful. Yeah, they ended up having to take steroids just to get my feet back on the ground and learn, you know, and have sort of this crash course in environmental toxins. Unfortunately, um, you know, being the person also suffering from it at the same time. Um, so that delayed things. Uh, and then like the pandemic happened and was just kind of made everybody's lives a little bit weird for various reasons. And during that time, uh, one of the weird things that happened in my life was that we ended up just totally leaving Toronto and moving to the Bay Area. Um, my husband's in the biotech space. So just career wise, you know, it was kind of dead end in Toronto and, and he was eager to get back here. So moving here, changing of environments, um, you know, we had, we're kind of at the standstill because of all the lockdown. We couldn't get our house properly, you know, taken care of or treated. So I'm stuck in this environment that's not well. So we, um, we moved here. I focused on getting better. And then um, we decided, okay, you know, we're going to try to start a family. And actually at the beginning, it just became logistically difficult. You know, women ovulate for 36 hours a month. Um, and of the six months we quote unquote conventionally tried, like we were only in the same town or country twice. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of life came in the way. And one of my friends said, okay, you know, just lean into IUI. I mean, you guys have resources, you're in the Bay Area for crying out loud, like just do it in this way, you don't have to worry about it. But through going to that experience, I learned that my ovarian reserves were really quite low. And this is a consequence of having PCOS in my younger life, just like burning through follicles and eggs that I had. You know, a woman's fertility span largely depends, you know, on the how many eggs you have and, and how, you know, we've gone through them over our lifespan. So we only genetically get so many eggs at, at birth. You know, that's we get what we get. And then certain lifestyle things or medical conditions like PCOS can cause you to really plow through those at an early age. So, you know, we were looking at the numbers and we started with the IUI um, and we realized that it could be a slow process. And we thought, okay, you know, like we would like to have a couple of kids and I'm not going, I'm going to be in my forties for the next kid. And what if I don't have any ovarian reserves come that time? So, you know, a lot of people think um, or just sort of misunderstood, like I went into IVF to um, because I was struggling with unknown infertility. That's not the case. We did it intentionally to bank embryos so we could have options of having kids in my you know, 40s if I wanted to have, you know, number two or number three down the road. Um, but because of my low ovarian reserves, we had to do three rounds uh, of wow. egg collections. 
and then of course the the odds are better if you do them back to back so i felt like i spent 2022 just being this scientific chicken in, <laughs> in the lab um but we we've got our we've got our embryos um we're we're pregnant we're expecting a little boy this fall it'll be a little turkey baby um so we're we're excited for that uh and then we've got a, a few more in the freezer for <laughs> for next time <laughs> oh that's awesome congratulations i'm so happy Happy for you, uh, you, a turkey baby. So yeah, that's going to be a great, <laughs> a great Thanksgiving. A lot to be thankful for that month. Yeah. Uh, so you, your story with the uh, environmental toxins. Let's go back to that for a second because you mentioned you did the traditional test for mold and all these different mm -hmm. things, and it passed. So what did you discover? Um, I know that we had chatted during that time. We we had some calls because you were very sick. And was it mold that they discovered? And how did you test for it? How was that discovery made? Yeah, so I, at the time, I, I, I reached out to so many colleagues. You were so gracious in, in helping me and probably one of the most helpful conversations too that I had. But at the time, I also just started throwing money at all kinds of things blindly. Like so many people who are sick do, I fell into that boat. Yeah. I probably spent well into the six figures, you know, in 2019, just trying to figure things out. And I ended up doing nutrigenomics testing as one of these 10,000 things through a company called the DNA Company. Um, and at the time, um, they gave you this option of syncing up with a natural path to go through the results. And I was actually very curious kind of about my hormonal genetic um, results because it looked like I was just this really genetically poor um, metabolizer of estrogen, but my on my Dutch test, my estrogen metabolism was looking pretty good. But I thought, okay, as I get older, you know, this could be potentially a problem. And you know, we had some ovarian cancer and whatnot in my family that was not genetic. But and I'm looking at these results, thinking, okay, maybe there's something here. So I signed up for this session with this naturopath. And then I started telling her, she was from Toronto, or very ironically, because I don't think the company is based in Canada, um, but perhaps I'm wrong. And um, she said, there's this guy, I want you to hire him. He's a very unique type of home inspector who really looks at things that traditional home inspectors don't do. It was quite pricey, it cost me a few thousand dollars, um, but he came in, he was there for nine hours doing all types of extensive testing. So we came back, there's all types of mycotoxins. And then through this natural path, you know, I, I had very much had a crash course in uh, functional medicine. Um, so we know a lot of people kind of lump me under that group because I do stuff that's outside of the box, but I'm really in like the diabetes, you know, stream of things primarily. Um, so, you know, I learned about mycotoxin testing, organic acid testing, GLP. We did the whole shebang of everything. I had heavy metal issues. Um, so I got all of this information. Um, we actually didn't get our house results back till after, you know, we had, we had moved. Um, but at that point, my test results were back. My personal test results were back. So um, I had a pretty good indication of what the, the home results were going to be. Um, and then with COVID, we were just never going to get anyone to come in and do anything. Um, so we moved here and then I got a really great local doctor. Um, so he was a cardiologist by training, um, suffered from mycotoxins and other type of heavy metal issues himself, totally flipped when the integrative health route. Um, so we, you know, we repeated my testing a few months after moving because it had changed. Just being removed from the environment had changed quite a bit. Um, and then we started the whole process of, you know, detoxification. So there were certain um, supplements that he gave me, some herbal, um, you know, really focusing on things like infrared saunas. He's just sweat anywhere you can, you know, and just turn the heat up in your car and just sweat, sweat, sweat. Um, uh, but infrared saunas and, you know, doing all kinds of things just to help. And within about a year, I was in a much better place. My testing was all normal across the board. I felt like a totally different person my husband felt like he had a different wife you know like the person that he had married versus the monster that I had kind of become I just didn't have energy or the capacity for for anything for a couple of years 
So it was quite the quite the journey, um, and you know, just really opened my eyes about. You know, we, we talk so much in sort of my world, of the fasting method, about nutrition and food quality and all that type of stuff. But really, like the, your whole environment around you. Um, and I remember us having a specific question, and you knowing at the time that I did want to be a mom and just hang out, you know, get better um, because you'll have a much healthier kid, you know, when you're closer to 40 than you would right now. And I remember you saying that and just like giving me a lot of confidence that, okay, you know, like I'm doing the right thing, but I couldn't have even sustained life even if I tried. I think at that point I was so sick. Hey, Keto Camper, I want to interrupt the video real quick to share with you what I believe is one of the most important nutrients that we should be taking every single day. Most people are deficient in this nutrient and it's responsible for over 400 enzymatic activities in your body and your body just doesn't make it. So it's required to be taken in a high quality supplement or from high quality foods. The problem with the food is that our soil is depleted and it's hard to get this quality nutrient. So what is this nutrient? It's called magnesium, but I'm gonna share something with you very fascinating. Check this out. Upgraded Formulas has this incredible product called Upgraded Magnesium. And Barton Scott, the developer of this product and company, he's a brilliant guy. He created nanoparticle magnesium, which has the ability to penetrate your membranes and go right into your cells. There's a 99.99 percentage absorption rate. Now, this is unheard of because with other magnesium products, you better believe it's not that high. And there's an interesting study they're doing with Upgraded Mag. I want to share with you real quick. Early results from a sleep study with Dr. Sachin Patel showed that the average doctor in the group using this product has achieved an improvement of over 35% in deep sleep. More sleep studies and a double-blind controlled placebo study with Upgraded Magnesium is coming sooner. And you better believe those results are going to be super exciting. We already know this. Upgraded Magnesium is easily the best supplement you can take for better sleep, including deep sleep, muscle aches, cramping, and any other signs of a magnesium deficiency, which is so common, unfortunately. What makes Upgraded Formulas unique, as I mentioned, is that it's a nanoparticle. This means it is absorbed very rapidly and efficiently by your blood cells. They produce a plasma-like version of minerals that the body recognizes and absorbs without digestion. And the results are phenomenal. I really believe just taking this for a couple of nights, you'll notice a big difference. So if you want to get Upgraded Formulas, Upgraded Mag, and any of their products. They also do some incredible hair mineral analysis tests to see your mineral imbalances and deficiencies, et cetera, and other incredible products that we've referenced before. Head over to upgradedformulas.com and use the coupon code KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com. Coupon code is KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. I'm going to drop a link for you down below in the notes of this video. Okay, let's go back to this video. Oh my gosh. Yeah, what a story. You're, you're so right. You know, in this day and age, Megan, diet alone and intermittent fasting alone for a lot of people is just not enough because of the amount of, of environmental toxins. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, my, my story is very similar. The house that I used to live in before where I live in now, where I live now, had hidden black mold and I couldn't figure it out until, you know, I hired a special company and I saw it. They remediated the whole thing, but I ended up just leaving either way. I just wanted to get out of that that entire environment. You, you mentioned there was a guy that came in like a nine hour inspection. Do you, uh, what was his name? Can you share his name or his company? His name was Robert. Um, okay. I, I can I can let you know afterwards if you yeah. wanted to include it in the show. I was just now. curious because there's another guy that we use with Dr. Pompa in our group. Uh, his mm -hmm. name is Ryan Blazer from mm -hmm. Test My Home who did something similar. I was curious if it was the same the same person. Uh, but yeah, what you did is so important because we we pass on these toxins, environmental toxins, especially heavy metals to kids. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the number one exposure to lead is is from mom, right? So the yeah. fact that you cleared a lot of this out was so important for your your baby boy that's about to get born into this world. So you did. Your, I know it took some time to get there, but it was it was so worth it. I'm so glad you're feeling better too. It's like mold is such a nasty. Mycotoxins are just so dis, they disrupt your metabolism. They disrupt your mitochondria. Well, I always tell people, if you feel like you're doing everything right and you don't feel well, think mold, right? Would you agree to that? Yeah, absolutely. I see it so much now 
in people that we work with in our community and just trying to encourage them. Um, finally, one of our community members, she just did the, the mycotoxin testing through Great Plains um, after a couple of years of me badgering her. And of course, you know, the, yeah. whole, the whole test did not look so good. So now they're getting their home remediated. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's just awful. Like it nearly cost me everything. Um, after everything I had overcome with my metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance and curing all of these metabolic illnesses and losing all of this weight um, and getting my life back, I almost lost it again. And in addition, like I almost lost my marriage, uh, like almost had to shut the doors on the fasting method. Cause I like most people, like my, one of my doctors said, you know, we should put you on disability. Like you shouldn't be trying to work. Um, and often I spent many days in bed um, because I was just unable to. I'm so fortunate that I've got this really amazing team that just kind of carried things through those couple of years. Um, I, I don't know what I would do without them because it went like we still wouldn't be around. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of a, a total nightmare. So, yeah, even uh, and I, you know, I. Uh, I had the best quality food. I, you know, knew what to eat um, for my body. I had, you know, fasting as a tool. I had all my gadgets and my gizmos as well, um, and just nothing. Um, as long as I was constantly being bombarded by that, it, it was just wild. The cellular inflammation was just wild. I ended up on thyroid medication when I was there, and I, I was taking just T3 only because my body was under so much stress. My cortisol was so high. Um, I was taking steroids too on top of it for a while. Um, and all my T4 would just get converted to reverse T3. So I'd feel mm -hmm. awful. So I ended up on 160 micrograms of T3 a day when I lived there just to kind of function and just to have a decent blood pressure. Um, and then flash forwards like moving here, I don't, I actually presently not taking any. Um, wow. and <laughs> it was just, that was just kind of wild. Like the whole, just how much inflammation I had. And actually within a few months of moving here, I had a kind of a bit of a total crash, like an extreme case of hyperthyroidism. I thought mentally I'd lost my mind. And, um, when we did my, my blood work, my free T3 was just insanely high. Um, and that's how like quickly removing um, myself from that environment and putting myself in a healthier environment, um, how quickly it impacted me. So it's, it's I mean, it's difficult. Um, you know, the sort of the traditional conventional stuff really doesn't assess for these type of things in homes. And then something like Toronto, like we, we had looked, we had bid on like 37 homes. You had a bid one or $200,000 over asking at least to be considered. Um, it was a crazy, crazy market. Um, and so we just, you know, we almost didn't care at that point. You get so defeated um, and you get what you get uh, at the end of it. But, you know, at the cost of what? Um, and, you know, and it's the same here in the Bay Area. You know, if you put in, you know, even a home inspection, you're going to lose out in the house because there's mm -hmm. going to be 40 offers without a home inspection uh, as a criteria. So, um, the real is just a really wild place. But you know, if uh, you know, moving here now, knowing that there's certain things that we can't always do before buying a property, you know, we need to make the commitment to get it thoroughly investigated and do the work and be aware that, you know, there could be some hefty costs associated with doing that work down the road. So, yeah, yeah, it's been wild. I'll tell you, it's really, been yeah. Wild. Well, I'm so glad you're feeling better. And yeah, that's a, the mold thing is a big problem in Florida because it's such a, 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 there's a lot of humidity here and yeah. there's a, there's mold everywhere. Dr. Pampa has a good nose for it. Like when we're at hotels, he could tell just by smelling <laughs> the hallways, if there's yeah. mold in the hotel. Uh, I don't have that sort of sensitivity <laughs> to it, but yeah, if I remember for me too, I mean, I was, I wasn't as debilitated as you were, I was not bedridden, but this is 2016, 2017 or so. I remember having like take constantly take naps throughout the day, canceling on my appointments because I just mm -hmm. didn't have the energy. It was just, I was just so tired and so fatigued. My sleep was awful. I was starting to get these like hollow eyes where I, I thought it was from lack of sleep, but I did some research and they're called mold eyes yeah. where I was, you know, so all these things started to happen. And Dr. Pompa was the one who was like, you got to get your house tested the right way. I'm like, I did a test, but to, you know, what happened with you, same thing that happened to me. It was a traditional test. It needs to be much more investigated. So I hope us having this conversation 
I turned on some light bulbs for those watching and listening. To go get a real test done. I mean, the one I use is uh, testmyhome.com or even a company called Pure Maintenance. And if Megan gives me the other gentleman, yeah. I can put it in the notes as well. So, okay, so you're feeling better. And in the midst of your pregnancy, you have a new book coming out. <laughs> And depending on when this comes, this episode comes out, the book comes out June 6th. Mm -hmm. So that's just right around the corner. It might be out. I'm not sure when this is going to be, be released, but uh, June 6th is the release date of your book. And it's a book all about intermittent fasting and fasting strategies for women. And the question is, why should women practice fasting differently than men, Megan? Well, we're very hormonally different species than our male counterparts. Um, so my book really does focus a lot on women with metabolic disease and women with type 2 diabetes specifically. And I do strongly believe that you know we need to tackle the insulin resistance aggressively, even in the case of PCOS. I mean, it's the insulin resistance often driving the PCOS and the other hormonal imbalances that are seen. And a lot of people sort of take the approach of fixing the hormonal balances first and then the insulin resistance secondary. That never really made a whole lot of sense to Jason Fung or I. Um, and we've always kind of gone aggressively at the insulin resistance first. Um, but uh, you, we, the, the bottom line though is that we are very hormonally different at every stage yeah. of our, our lives, I, you know, from from birth, you know, especially through adolescence, early adulthood, um, childbearing years, after childbearing years, it's different. And different hormones can make it very easy for us or difficult for us to fast. And fasting at certain points can also suppress certain hormones that are, you know, really counterproductive towards our health goals and can cause other metabolic health issues and fertility issues, for example. So the biggest thing is fasting in the cycle. And, you know, women, you, men can fast in a box. They can pick a box. They can look at a, a list of protocols and say, this one looks good. The 248 hour fast a week, that looks good. And they can just kind of do it, you know? Um, women awesome. can't. <laughs> good for us, but not for women, yeah. <laughs> no, they can't, they can't just do it um, yeah. with women. And then there's this like constant, you know, need to like really come down on ourselves uh, in society. We've just been blamed so much. You get blamed by everybody under the sun for your weight. You get blamed by everyone under the sun for your metabolic illness. Um, and they're, everybody's giving you wrong information. The government, your doctors, the the food guidelines, they're all giving you illness. You know, they're, they're sick guides. They're not health guides. They're not health protocols. And then they blame you. So I don't, like, women are just taught especially to blame themselves and men too. Uh, I think women tend to really sort of carry a strong burden with this because there's, I, I think, a unique judgment on a person's physical appearance when they're female. That's not always there for our male counterparts. So women, you know, see men doing this and they read about a protocol in the book, um, 342 hour fast or alternate daily fasting, for example. I'm going to do that. But then sometimes it's so hard for them to do and they think something's wrong or broken with them. Or sometimes they actually feel worse or start to experience other hormonal complications and then they get scared of fasting. It's like, well, you shouldn't do that either. Um, but we need to learn how to fast with our hormonal cycles. So, you know, myself and then other peers who have talked about the same subject have written about it too. Um, Dr. Mindy Powell, Cynthia Turlow, they've got really, really fabulous books on women and fasting, I think all from different angles. Mm -hmm. um, but they all talk about the importance of fasting with their cycle and I do shed light on that too. You know, our, the women's cycles you know, divided into sort of two parts with this middle event in between called ovulation. The first part's the follicular phase, and the second part is the luteal phase. And during the follicular phase, our estrogen is the more predominant hormone. Estrogen can make us feel pretty good in the right volume dosage. Um, it can make us feel pretty good. It can also suppress our appetites. Um, in the luteal phase, we have uh, estrogen coming down sharply after ovulation. Unless you get pregnant, then estrogen will start to come back up. So if pregnancy doesn't occur after ovulation, progesterone tends to be our dominant hormone during that particular part of the cycle. And then testosterone is more predominant in the second half of the cycle too. Um, but progesterone is a really big appetite driving hormone. So it can make it really difficult for us to fast. 
and fasting and even following like a ketogenic diet consistently during that particular part of the cycle can suppress progesterone levels. Women with PCOS often already have low progesterone levels anyways, and this results in conditions of estrogen dominance and other metabolic imbalances within the body. So doing this can further worsen it. So first of all, it's difficult. You're struggling with hunger, you're struggling with cravings, and then just depending on other physiological conditions like having low progesterone secondary to PCOS, it's not always in PCOS, but often in PCOS is characterized by low progesterone in that luteal phase of the cycle. Well, the fasting suppresses the production of progesterone. So you just kind of end up on this, you know, hamster wheel of insanity. If you're trying to do intensive fasting and you're following a really strict and rigid ketogenic diet during that time, and we can really sort of beat ourselves up for it and cause other issues. So, you know, we try to moderate the fast depending on where a woman is in their cycle. And, you know, one of the things we always talk about, you've heard Jason say it a bunch of times, you've heard me say it a bunch of the times, you know, one of the best things you can do to avoid plateaus when you're incorporating therapeutic fasting as an intervention for fat loss is to change it up you know, uh, change it up. And so, you know, people often ask, often come and offer to pay me money to teach them how to change it up. Mm -hmm. Well, women, you know, we've got this sort of great hormonal cycle that demands that we change it up. You know, uh, almost every week of the cycle, we can look at it differently. So during the initial phase of the cycle, you know, usually even day one of the cycle, there's still hormonal fluctuations. Women find it difficult to fast. But usually come day three of the cycle, this is the time to engage in more longer therapeutic fast. So this is the time to really embrace that ADF lifestyle or to maybe push the envelope, you know, during sort of that, you know, day three to day 10, if someone's interested in experimenting with an extended fast, you know, this would be a good time to, to play around with that. And then the appetite does get triggered by ovulation. I mean, it's our evolutionary job to try to get pregnant ladies. Um, that is the goal. Survival. Uh, survival. And fasting is anti-growth. Um, mm -hmm. Fasting is anti, you know, generating a baby. Um, so our hormones come into play to help us generate growth in life. Um, so they're very contradictory to fasting. So during ovulation, you know, some shorter fasts, you know, focusing on good time restricted eating, and then that can carry on into the luteal phase of the cycle. And then usually those, you know, seven days, sometimes 10 days leading up to the cycle, it's just focusing on good time restricted eating strategies. And sometimes we lose more fat by actively taking time and eating more. Um, I see this all of the time in the early summer days when we start to have long weekends, um, like May, for example, that we've recently gone through. You know, there's um, Victoria Day weekend in Canada, Memorial Day weekend in the U.S., and people will have these periods of time of eating more and then suddenly dropping a couple pounds after doing really intensive fasting, like, uh, you know, 72 plus a 24 every week for weeks on end throughout the winter time. Um, so changing it up and, you know, so we encourage women, look that we use this time, focus on good, you know, eating strategies, experiment with good, you know, um, new meals and, and things that you've wanted to try in the kitchen and embrace it as a week of really trying to change things up. Um, so we just trying to sync up with our hormones. It helps optimize our hormones. You know, by tackling the strategy, you can really sort of help support hormones like progesterone production and PCOS woman. So we're, you know, we're not totally um, ignoring the sex hormones while trying to teach or treat the insulin resistance simultaneously. And then of course, you know, as we go through hormonal changes in life, there's still these ebbs and flows. I have one client who, you know, right now seems to have a period every, you know, four to six months. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's sort of identifying the different hormonal shifts, not beating ourselves up with fasting focusing on time-restricted eating strategies and really good nutrition that's going to support her through those times. And by doing that, you know, we're able to at least maintain weight or even see improvement in body composition and metabolic markers during that time. And even post-menopausal, women still tend to have a bit of a cycle um, that ebbs and flows with this. So, you know, teaching everyone to kind of embrace it for those hormonal changes and shifts that do happen.
I want to take a quick break from the video you're watching to share something with you that has made a big difference with my health and the thousands and thousands of students that I teach all across the world. Now, this is a unique device that has been shown to help with skin health, sore muscles, wrinkles, psoriasis, eczema, scoliosis, migraines, sleep issues, arthritis, acne, scar tissue, wound healing, relaxation, and also boost testosterone levels. What am I talking about? What is this miracle drug? Well, it's not a miracle drug. It's red light therapy. As you can see here, this is called photobiomodulation. And I use this red light therapy device every single day. Not only do I use it, my fiance uses it. Our dogs and cats love it. And the device I have here is from Bon Charge. Bon Charge has a different range of big panels, small panels, from affordable to ones that are a little bit more money depending on how much you want. And I love this product. I feel so good. And it doesn't take a lot of time to get all these benefits. I simply take off my glasses, which is Bon Charge glasses, by the way, turn it on, and I have it running for 20 minutes once a day. And turn it on, and as you can see, I just leave it there on my desk as I work. 10, 20 minutes uh, per day will suffice, and it makes a big difference. You're gonna notice a big improvement with your skin health and all the things we mentioned earlier in just a matter of weeks. So if you wanna get your hands on this Bond Charge red light device or get their big panels, they also have panels that you could take on the go that are more affordable, then head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp and use the coupon code keto camp to get 15% off your red light device. Or as a matter of fact, your entire order, any product, you could get 15% off with that nice coupon code keto camp. So whether it's these bond charge blue light blocking glasses, their sauna blanket, or any of their awesome products, use that coupon code keto camp at checkout. We'll drop a link down below. Go check them out. They're awesome. And let's get back to today's video. Yeah, and I want to get into the postmenopausal uh, a little bit later. Let's stick with the cycling women. So it makes sense, right? The days three through days 10 of that um, first half of the cycle, you want, you're going to have naturally more progesterone. And you mentioned it's appetite suppressant. So you're going to, it's going to be just more natural and easier to fast to do ketosis to keep your carbs under 20 grams if you want to do that. But then you have ovulation and then you have the, the 10 days or so preceding your, your period, your bleed week, where progesterone is the major hormone at play there. And to what you just said, you don't really build progesterone with block fasting or excessive fasting or even like strict ketosis. You build it with more feasting, more healthy carbs. And you, that's also why a lot of ladies, I, I know, I'm sure you've seen this too, get those cravings the week before their period, right? For chocolate. I mean, speak to that. Like, have you noticed that? Like before we knew the science, did you get that anecdotally? Oh yeah, everybody. And as a woman yeah. myself, I yeah, experienced exactly. that. And you know, it's kind of at that second half of the cycle too, is when we tend to be more insulin resistant mm -hmm. um, during that second half. So I think it's really so important for women to work on nutrition during that time. There's a big difference too, between engaging in some sweet potato and chowing down on like a, a milk chocolate bar or, you know, a, a ice cream sundae of sorts. Um, and, and of course, nutrient density is so uh, so important but the cravings are just kind of wild and a lot of women blame themselves for this too and don't attribute it to hormonal changes and it's just like no it is attributed to hormonal changes and i actually find the women who have the lowest progesterone levels like when we test during that sort of day 18 to day 21 um is that depending on whether your cycle is a little bit on the shorter side or a little bit on the longer side i mean we tend to try to do the sex hormone blood work for ovulating women uh, who are childbearing years between day 18 and day 21. And then the progesterone is always kind of low. So the women that are struggling the most are experiencing the most cravings. Mm. Um, so it's directly tied to the body's just desire to try to, you know, have adequate progesterone levels during that particular time. So it's just so important, you know, to focus on real good food nutrition and not beat yourself up for those particular cravings. It's normal to experience it, you know, until, you know, processed and refined foods. You know, we women didn't know about, you know, ice cream sundaes. And, and uh, but now, you know, we, we've been encouraged, you know, you're three years old, you get an ice cream sundae because it's Sunday and it's baseball day, you know, growing up. 
So our brains automatically connect that to the dopamine response and the type of response it wants to have in the body. So we're conditioned. I, I always know that something like an ice cream sundae is it, for five to 10 minutes going to make me feel pretty good. I've had you know, several of them um, in my previous lifetime. Um, so don't beat yourself up for that. You know, it's a lot easier for you at some points like me now to say, okay, I, I'm going to have a little bit of, you know, berries and, you know, like sheep yogurt or something like that mm -hmm. when I craving ice cream instead um, so uh, and you can lean into that and that's actually very supportive of your hormones yeah that makes total sense to me so what about the the woman who's listening and they're not perimenopause they're not in menopause they're actually of their cycling years but for whatever reason they're maybe on birth control or they might have had some sort of procedure they're, they don't have a monthly cycle what are some variations should they follow like a moon cycle what do you recommend for that yeah moon cycles pretty good to go through i really hate a lot of these hormonal contraceptives and it's just it's just the first line of defense for anything when you're 14 and you've got cramps go on the birth control pill or happened to my fiance oh yeah. for cramps and for acne yep I was, I, I was 14, I was prescribed it because I was afraid of getting acne. I didn't even have any. I was one of those PCOS faces without a spot um, on it, but my girlfriends growing up had it and I was afraid. So my mom took me to the doctor and they gave me birth control. I did have a very long-term boyfriend starting at the age of 14 and as we got older, he just became very skeptical and he's like, can't we just count your cycle? Mm -hmm. um, and you not take it because I'm worried about this having issues. And then I was just so grateful that he, you know, was skeptical of it, you know, going into life later on. But then they have all of these hormonal IUDs and things now yeah. and even more invasive hormonal um, birth control options that just totally don't have a period at all, like ever or every three months or every six months. I hear some of my girlfriends, you know, talking about. Um, so you can use the moon cycle to sometimes with women, it will just go, I, I'm working with this one young woman now and just really just going with her hormones and, and what she feels. If fasting feels easy, we turn up the dial. Like yeah. If it doesn't feel easy, we turn it down the dial. This particular young woman, she does her hormonal birth control she does occasionally have mm. cycles a few times a year um so we just turn it up we turn it down we focus on the nutritional aspects of things um and just listen to how she's feeling and i think because she's so young actually she's in her 20s um there isn't that sort of long-term history. Like she wasn't told to diet at eight or nine years old. When she was eight or nine, it, you couldn't talk to kids about their weight like at all. Not kind of like how my grandparents grew up. My grandmother, you know, was ridiculed if she was a pound overweight, you know, mm. even if she was a child. Um, so this generation is a little, I was never ridiculed, you know, whether I weighed too much. People actually complained that I weighed, I was too skinny for a lot in my childhood. Um, so she never really had a whole lot of hangups over it other than her own, you know, desire to be a certain size or to look a certain way as she started to get older. So she's really cool. Like she doesn't beat herself up over it. She's like, okay, you know, uh, it's really feeling impossible right now. So it could be hash, like could be how she's related due to some things. I mean, she's young and living life as a young, um, Long, young person so the nutrition's not always a hundred percent all of the time so maybe there's a flare up there that needs to be looked at or you know maybe her cycle's going to start soon um so we just twist things around focus on good eating but yeah you, you can really just kind of listen to how you feel i think it's a really good way to do it because people have no idea how they feel nowadays hmm. so you yeah. know really checking in with yourself on a regular basis or every few days you know what feels good right now what can i do right now with fasting and with eating and then listening to that intuition it usually guides you um fairly accurately yeah, I, I love that advice. Probably that's probably the moon cycle advice is great too. But probably like listening to your body is, is better because so many people don't. Right, the body's always giving us communication through symptoms, which people view as a bad thing, but it's a really good thing. Um, I, I want to get your thoughts on this because what I what I've been doing with um, some of my Keto Camp Academy students to gauge if this would be a good fasting day or a good day to restrict their um, carbohydrates, I tell them, of course, what you just said. How do you feel? But I also have them look, I have them track their heart rate variability with like an aura ring. And if I see it 
uh, drop like more than usual, then I tell them it's probably not a good day. Your nervous system is a little stimulated. What are your thoughts on looking at heart rate variability? I love heart rate variability. I'm like on year six of an aura ring. Um, yeah, I've... me too. I think we're like, right there. <laughs> I love it. It's one of the, it's yeah. actually probably we have the, same color too. <laughs> the only yeah. tracker. Yeah, I've only changed them over the years for colors, the color, like for fashion purposes. Um, and then of course I, I wanted the the third generation when it came out because I'm same. such a, such a aura ring um, fanatic and um, my husband's got one if you're in my orbit. Um, no, I think that's really great advice. There are some women that I work with that have chronically low HRVs and um, mm. they then they tend to be a little bit older in life um, had a lot of life happen to them sort of past childbearing years or the desire you know for fertility and childbearing years is you know come to an end for them and they're moving on into other phases of life and then sometimes you'll find that you know, we've got to address the holistic picture to you know the stress how are they taking care of that their mind um, you know the we, we're actually talking a lot now about the art of eating rather than what you eat but like how you eat um, and the digestive mm -hmm. response to that so you know we work on that making sure they've got a designated eating area that you know they're not even scrolling through Instagram looking at puppies they are just yeah. really there present with their food maybe listening to nice music in the background um but really focusing on addressing you know stress in that aspect when it comes to around eating trying to change meal timing to eating that bigger meal earlier on in the day you know maybe not having dinner or having a lighter dinner um what we would typically have in north america for lunch like having that at, at the dinner hour instead. Um, and then, you know, if we can see some improvement in sleep quality, then trying to do some longer fast. But we've got a lot of these people that chronically, their HRVs are just chronically like what do you like? Well, in, in, all of the oh, okay, I was gonna ask, so like in the teens, you see, mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty low. Yeah, um, I've seen that too with, with a few of, of my students. Uh, yeah, that's the, for them, you know, they would really have to pay attention to how they feel. You know, the, the Aura Ring, it's fantastic. I love it just like you. My fiance has it too. And a lot of my students, I, I suggest they get it because it helps us as coaches kind of view what's going on. But I also think it's important to pay attention to how you feel, right? I don't want my aura ring to tell me I'm going to have a bad day. I'm not going to be energized today. So there's like kind of like a double-edged sword with it because sometimes I'll wake up and I'm like, man, I feel really refreshed. That, what are my scores? And I'm so excited to see my scores in the morning. And it's like, 72 you know rest day i'm like wait a minute but i feel so good so how do you how do you interpret that or teach that to your clients it has to be about curiosity looking mm -hmm. at it with curiosity and not judgment these numbers aren't reflective of everything it's the same thing with people that are becoming healthy and are fasting um, regularly and increasing their activity seeing the number on the scale not change but their pants falling off don't True. get defeated by that number on the scale look at it curi curiously how are my clothes fitting? Oh, my clothes are falling off. Oh, I must be losing body fat, but also gaining lean mass now that I'm being so much more active that I'm feeling better. Um, it's the same thing with continuous glucose monitors. I don't know if I love them or I hate them at this present moment because um, so fortunately, like they've become very accessible to everybody in yeah. the United States. Um, they're certainly a lot more economical. You don't need to have you know, diabetes now to get mm -hmm. one. Um, so, you know, really grateful for those opportunities. Um, and then, so now, but now everyone has one and they watch them as hawks. And then like, what's going on? What's wrong? You know, I had a woman who was in the fast the other day and went and had like this killer weight training session, but her glucose went up a bit. Yeah. And she totally freaked out. So, yeah. you know, that, that, ha that is going to <laughs> be what Good happens. thing. I mean, that's supposed to happen during a, a session happen. like that. Yeah. So come, I actually had one client with a Dexcom and I recently had to tell her, you need to take it off mm. because you're giving yourself worsened diabetes by watching it all of the time. She was hysterical about it and we talked about it. And, and so she cut it off, but now her, like her morning blood sugar levels, which were in the 160s are now in the 110s. 
Um, wow. So and just like cutting it off for like a month. Um, so the, this constant data, if we're looking at it with a lot of judgment and letting it sort of dictate and rule, you know, how we're governing and functioning in our lives entirely. Um, I think it can present more stress than be positive. I always, you know, especially now when I'm pregnant, my aura ring data is super weird. Um, oh, and sure. uh, there is there is actually a time and I had an embryo transfer. So anyone listening, um, this is one of the most stressful things in your life because you don't know if it's going to take or not. And I think it was like three days after I knew I had felt implantation cramping that my body temperature dropped on my aura ring. Wow. So then there's the scientist in me who is like, you, you've been waking up to pee every three hours. You're also waking up at 2 a.m. because your hormones are kind of nutty. Um, you can't pay attention to your body temperature on your aura ring data. It's not accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so and then the, there's the mom in me, like the, or the, the woman who wanted to be a mom in me, who saw it and thought, oh my God, I miscarried. I had a chemical mm. pregnancy. Um, so I actually, <laughs> I left my, my aura ring on the charger till I was 10 weeks pregnant after that point. So, you know, even myself, I can totally relate because there's the scientist in me who so knows, who preaches about this to people all day long, whether it's their aura ring or their Dexcom or yeah. just Keto their Mojo. scale. Yep. Yeah, um, look at it with curiosity, but sometimes there's a time and a place to park it and just really check in on yourself. And during those 10 weeks, you know, I felt all of the the right things and normal things and some of the unpleasant things <laughs> that a, a woman experiences in an early pregnancy and um, it was just really nice to tune into my body I'm really just experience and live it the good the bad the ugly that happens in the first trimester with with those things and you know not perhaps always let data so there's a time and a place to look at the data and use it as a tool I think that's super cool you know like Jason will often say um, with some people you know the well, eat when your glucose is a certain level and avoid eating when your glucose is another level. And for some people, they can use that loosely as a guide to help them navigate when they fast and when they eat or the times of day that they might eat versus, you know, not eat if they're a type 2 diabetic. Um, but there's also a time and a place to just say, okay, this is what it is, but, you know, this is how I feel and listen to that intuition instead. Yeah, I love the curiosity um, concept. It's it's so true, especially as all these devices are becoming more readily available. And thank God, that's awesome. But yeah, you want to make sure you also pay attention to your body. I have a couple of uh, questions still on the subject of cycling women, and then we'll mm -hmm. transition to postmenopausal women and some of the strategies you have in your book for them. So the moon cycle, if you could just, I, mean, I know somebody's listening and watching, they're like, they didn't explain the moon cycle. And I, I would hate if we went through it and we didn't give the, how to do that. So for those who want to follow the moon cycle, could you just give them a general guide uh, for that? I would have to like reference my own book to look it up. I do not know it <laughs> off my ass. I usually tell people to go by the way that they're feeling, but they okay. did make me talk about it in the book. So. Oh, they did? Your, your uh, publisher did? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the book is going to have that protocol for you. Um, the second question for the uh, cycling women is going to be this, right? What about somebody who is a sugar burner? We know they have probably insulin resistance. We know they do. Let's say they have insulin resistance or full on type two diabetic as a matter of fact, and they just started on this fasting journey, this keto journey. Should they be strict for a period of time before they practice these variations and different strategies with more carbs and, and different variations? That's a good question, and I, it's a, I know it's a controversial question, and even on our own team, um, we look at it through different lenses, and sometimes we'll approach different clients um, with, with different intentions. Um, so an example would be, this is when we had our clinic in Toronto. Jason and I had a 22-year-old woman who hadn't had a period in a few years. Her mom dragged her into the clinic. She didn't care whether or not to be there. She worked at McDonald's part-time and went to university full-time. Um, and she was paying her way through, you know, her, her family was new to Canada. Um, so they were really rebuilding. Um, so funds weren't there uh, and assistance wasn't there for them. Um, and so she was not, she, this, she admittedly was not thinking past like the next weekend of events in her life and didn't know if she wanted kids at all in her life um, and her mom's like, well, you might when you're 30 or 35, change your mind. 
so we need to fix this now before it becomes problematic. Um, but her insulin resistance was just awful. Um, you know, it wasn't even the fact that she hadn't had a period in two or three years. Like her blood work across the board was horrendous. In Canada, we use picomoles per liter for assessing insulin. It was in the 400s um, mm. in a fasted state uh, of 14 hours. It, it was just off the charts, horrendous. Um, so Jason's approach was to faster, like we would fast, um, as close to say like a 55 year old male as possible. If she did struggle with a lot of cravings or whatnot, it was fine, then she could focus on her nutrition and time restricted eating for that particular week, but to push through with as much therapeutic stuff as we could. So. And this young woman, her and I made a pet. She was not necessarily going to change what she ate. That was the, you know, this was the deal, but she would do her fasting and she would not snack. She mm. would eat at certain times in the day and she would cut it off, including alcohol consumption at a certain point. And Jason wanted her to do three 36 hour fasts a week. Now she wasn't much of a breakfast person, which uh, is controversial in cycling women too, whether or not they should have or shouldn't have um, breakfast. As a woman trying to get pregnant, I was eating breakfast and lunch and not necessarily so much dinner. Um, but she wasn't hungry and it was just garbage food. It was even more garbage than the other meals of the day that she was having. So we kind of let the breakfast slide. So she fell onto more of the 42s. Um, so this is the compromise, no snacking, no late night eating or drinking, and she would do her fast. She did it. She actually didn't struggle that much, um, you know, at, at any point um, at all with it. And six months later, she had her first period. Um, wow. And then we carried on with that strategy, like the very aggressive insulin resistant, you know, type two diabetes fasting approach. Um, we carried on for about another three months, but she kept having consistent periods. So then we had three periods that were happening within, you know, 25 to 35 days there, you know, she was typically in the early thirties, the lengths of her cycle. And at that point we shifted things around once they started to become more consistent. Um, I'll say she's in her late twenties today. She follows an excellent diet. She's super healthy um, woman nice. and is really excited. She has this opportunity to be a mom. Her AMH is looking good. So that gives us an indication. Of the, it's a, one of the few markers you have to look at for assessing ovarian reserves so it was really good she got to it when she did you know like a lot of Canadians they move they come to Canada healthy and within five years of living in Canada they develop metabolic syndrome so fortunately you know prior to her immigration she was in, in fairly good health she hadn't been tainted by the Western diet so much and to that point so she had severe PCOS, um, absolutely, um, but it was kind of isolated, and she was able to um, really like she's she's doing fabulous. Uh, awesome. We still keep in touch, so we have definitely treated very sick. Her A one C was in the the diabetic range. I think it was six point seven, so we're I'm not talking nine point seven, but um, we have sort of treated the diabetes first. Uh, in yeah. some of these women. Makes sense. Yeah. So that, I mean, of, of course there's no simple answer to that question, right? So it's always going to be dependent on that unique person in front of you. So that's, that's a good story to share because we got to understand when, when the viewers are, when the readers are reading your book, it's like you're giving them the protocols, then you got to apply it to your unique hist health history. Maybe you're doing lab work and then your goals, et cetera. So we have um, a few minutes left. I want to make sure we cover some of the strategies in your book regarding the postmenopausal women out there because we know that that hormonal landscape changes. Maybe you could explain what happens with the ovaries and what makes up for the ovaries um, retiring essentially and then some fasting strategies from your book. Yeah, so our ovaries throughout our childbearing years, they're our, our dominant producers of sex hormones and then they, they go into retirement. Um, and this is where we start to see, you know, progesterone levels be really low. Women start to have sleep disturbances. Some women relying on exogenous progesterone to help um, balance them out. But our ovaries stop producing estradiols, kind of like the fun, sexy, happy estrogen. Uh, and then our um, 
our adrenal glands kick in and they start to substitute for the sex hormones that our ovaries are not outputting. So they output estrone instead of estrogen and estrone's not as fun or delightful mm -hmm. um, of the estrogen molecule. So it doesn't necessarily always leave you know women feeling so great. Um, so we get these sort of shifts in the ovaries going out of business um, or, or going to sleep to then shifts in the adrenal glands and then today's day and age with all the chronic stress mm -hmm. that we have the adrenal glands are already pretty taxed as it is so even their output of sex hormones is you know not always so wonderful um, and then women too are the fat that we accumulate as we get older or often do in, in today's day and age that also produces estrone um, and can throw uh, us into more of a state of estrogen dominance as our ovaries stop their production of progesterone and it just makes us more inclined to be insulin resistant and to trap fat and you know, all of these and things that we don't want to feel angry and depressed and irritable um, and poor sleep as we get older. Um, so we've always sort of tackled it um, with fairly, fairly aggressively. So when a woman's postmenopausal, um, we don't necessarily always lump them super different than their male counterparts when yeah. it comes to fasting. Um, you know, we really try to to fast. Also, work on the, you know the lifestyle interventions that are going to help with the adrenal function. You know, help them with insulin sensitivity, reverse their metabolic illness. But we well fast them fairly aggressively. We do notice that they experience sort of some of these ebbs and flows, and you know, some women are so convinced it's you know they're synced up with the moon and, and I mean that's cool and, and there's might be some truth to that um, so you know when we try to implement the same mindset you know don't beat yourselves up you know if it is a difficult time focus on time restricted eating you can even be a little bit more ketogenic in a certain state it's not like the ovaries have the ability to produce progesterone at that point in time um, you know there's certain foods that can aid in progesterone production but it's not going to matter so much at that particular time so you can be a little bit more consistently keto i still like to do carb cycling um, i like to do carb cycling with everybody Same. Um, yeah. i think it's very <laughs> beneficial um, but yeah, so we really just try to focus on the fat loss and the insulin resistance and losing the weight, then you don't have these issues with estrogen dominance or you have a lot less issues if you don't have them actively producing you know, estrogen all of the time. Um, so it's trying to get the hormones back in balance. So we treat these women just like they're diabetics and we fast them just like they're diabetics to treat their condition. And then of course, you know, again, allowing them time to show themselves some grace, you know, when they may experience some ebbs and flows in their fast. I love that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's good news for the postmenopausal ladies out there. You don't have to be as strategic as the cycling women who have to pay attention really week on a week by week basis. So you're like us guys, you know, you could be more aggressive. The only difference here is that you, you need to have that emphasis on the adrenal support, getting that oxytocin from whatever it is, you know, petting your dog or watching funny <laughs> movies, like all the life, you mentioned it, lifestyle changes to get that, to support those adrenal glands. And then something else that happens, which we won't, we don't have time to get into because we have to wrap this up, but there's a loss of um, bone during the perimenopause, menopausal phase, and there's a, lot, a loss of lead. So these heavy metals get dumped actually from, from the bones, mm -hmm. which actually make them feel worse too. So uh, your book's going to cover all of these strategies, we only kind of just scratched the surface here. So where is the best place to go get your book, Megan? Yeah, so you can head over to thefastingmethod.com. Um, we have a books page with all mine and Jason's stuff on it. I think there's links for whatever countries and languages. It's available for you to find it in your area through larger retailers or through some smaller independent retailers as well. And then, of course, you, know, you can find it on Amazon uh, in the U.S., Barnes & Noble, and Canada, Chapters Indigo. Um, so your your popular book finding places. Awesome. And Dr. Fung wrote the foreword, the goat himself, the greatest <laughs> of all time, Dr. Fung. Uh, in a minute or less, I'm going to ask you a question I've been asking all my guests uh, surrounding vitamin G, which is the supplement that I recommend everybody take. Speaking of the adrenal glands, the gra practice of gratitude. So Megan, what are you uh, grateful for today? <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is a weird one. Um, uh, I am grateful for every day that I experience nausea because it means my hormones are doing the right thing. Oh, I, wow. had to, I had to reframe that um, as a good thing rather than a bad thing since the start of this pregnancy. So this is something I think about and I try to express gratitude for every single day. I get to be sick. I have the privilege of being able to be sick and I am sick because my hormones are doing what they need to do without any medication, pharmaceutical assistance. My body is you know, developing life properly and my baby's growing. So it's a weird one, um, but you know, sometimes we can look at our, our illnesses or some of the things that we're experiencing with, see the silver lining and it sh I think it helps show us our own individual strength. Amen. That's the first time I've heard that one. So I, <laughs> I love it. Uh, thank you, Megan. I, round four was a treat. So thank you so much. Everybody go get the book and Megan will come back for round five uh, after she gives birth. We'll do that later. <laughs> thank you so much, Megan. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it.